come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast. We're a uh, movie review podcast that comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total world domination. And we need your help with that. What you can do is go on over to wherever you found us and hit that like or subscribe button. Hit the little bell to get notifications whenever we give you new episodes and write us a review or uh, give us a star rating all of that stuff helps us get found by other folks like you if you like what you hear here so these are the internet radio yeah. superstars <laughs> holly sean Mi- michaela colin and tonight we watched a movie that was chosen by colin uh w- what gross apparatus <laughs> What did you make us watch tonight? Uh, tonight, we watched the classic 1980 film City of the Living Dead, or you may have seen it when it was called Gates of Hell. Directed by? Uh, this is directed by Lucio Fulci. So uh, we're moving. Who also in, did? Uh, two movies that we did previously on our in our back catalog. Uh, he's most famous for doing Zombie. Uh if you're Shark in the fighting. UK, it's also known as Zombie Flesh Eaters, or if you're overseas, it's Zombie Two. Or it was a sequel to, uh, it was the Italian sequel to Dawn of the Dead. But that's a whole different story. You got to go listen to a <laughs> yeah. uh, zombie episode. And he also did a movie called The Beyond. I think those two are probably what he's best known for, unless you're a Jallo uh, fan, in which case you'd know him for a Lizard in a Woman Woman's Skin or Don't Tor- Torture a Duckling. Uh, Lucio Fulci is one of the, I don't know. I mean, when, when, because we're talking about Italian horror, I guess tonight, uh, again, you know, this is one of my favorite genres, I suppose. <laughs> and, uh, whenever anybody thinks of Italian horror, I think the three people probably that come to mind are, uh, Dario Argento obviously is the, the king of Italian horror, but you know, uh, and then, uh, Mario Bava is one of the guys who started it. And then probably, Lucio Fulci. I mean, he's famous enough that in Shaun of the Dead, right, they make a joke about Fulci's. Uh, it's the place that does all the fish, I think. You know, I mean, so there's a recognizable uh, uh, thing. And there's a documentary, a quasi documentary about him that's coming out right now called uh, uh, Fake is for Fulci or Fulci for Fake. Fulci for Fake, yeah. In which this guy who is an actor going to be playing Fulci and then he goes and actually interviews like the real people who knew uh director so that's coming out right now and i think gates play of, on the f for fake from orson wells yes okay yep Fred Riggs also has a fulci shirt coming out this week uh because as we're recording this he just ha- would have had his birthday um mm-hmm. he would have been in his 90s fulci uh, i believe he passed away in 1996 uh, from complications from diabetes he had a number of health problems there at the end of his life um, but, um, prior to that, I mean, he was known as the godfather of gore or the sultan of splatter. Uh, people apparently didn't know that the godfather of gore is actually Herschel Gordon Lewis, but because Fulci's Italian, he's the godfather of gore. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, I mean, the guy like through his entire career, he did a whole bunch of different uh, things. Like our, Dario Argento is basically known for doing giallos and some horror films right everybody forgets about the comedy that he did the five days of milan uh but fulci had like a range of stuff that he did i mean he did comedies he did westerns he did giallos uh he did sword and the sorcery movies um you know he was all over the map but i think his break his big breakout was uh when he made zombie in uh, 1979 a movie that you really have to check out if you haven't seen it because yes it has a scene. shark fighting yeah yeah well we say shark it's fighting awesome. but it's really fighting like a shark underwater movie. it's uh, pretty great well and everyone okay so that's the first thing everybody brings up but it's also got a really great like eye gouging scene too yeah oh yeah a very slow very traumatic eye gouging scene he's very also traumatic. He's like the king of ocular trauma. It seems like there's something happening to people's eyes in many of his movies. They get plucked out, gouged out, stabbed out. Just awful, horrible, horrible stuff. 
Um, the Beyond had our uh, squeaky spiders, didn't it? Yes. Ah, uh, my favorite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a yeah. That's a, a a little bit I think there that if you're a fan of the uh, the Spider Man movies, the first Sam Raimi Spider Man, uh, when Peter Parker gets bit, there's a flash frame of the spiders from the Beyond uh, mm-hmm. cut in there. Because it turns out that the editor of Sam Raimi's editor, Bob Murkowski, uh, he is the co-owner of Grindhouse Pictures that brought uh, the Beyond back to life with uh, Sage Stallone, the late Sage Stallone. They co-founded Grindhouse Releasing. Nice. Yeah. Doesn't the Beyond also have that, like, a, a shot where, like, it's like a, a zombie gets, like, shot through the back of the head and the camera kind of pulls out and you see through the hole? I, can't I remember, remember something like that in one of his movies, but maybe it wasn't the beyond. Well, he's like, I mean, he's known for a kind of, it's almost the way that Fulci lingers on moments of gore, right? I mean, people have called it, you know, it's like pornographic gore, just you know, in the way that, you know, it's like uh, most people would cut away at a certain point in an effect where, you know, like the gore is happening and Fulci like zooms in, you know, and hangs on it for a <laughs> while. Like, no, we go all the way. Yeah, but I've often wondered about that because, I mean, obviously, you know, he was also kind of infamous for in the 19, early 1980s when the whole uh, video nasties thing was happening in uh, Britain that most of his movies got confiscated or heavily censored. I think they were banned. You know, they didn't actually see them for years. But I um, forgot where I was going with that. The gore, the pornographic gore hanging on, hanging on the gore. The, the, the critics he? would kind of oh, think that like all the audience was sitting, you know, watching these movies, um, you know, like dwelling on it in a way, I guess, because, you know, you, you imagine, you know, that you're sitting in a room by yourself watching these now, but at the time they were theatrical experiences. And I think like, you know, people reacted to the stuff that they saw on screen with the, Ew, and, oh, and, you know, yelling. And it was probably a very vocal crowd. I assume when, sure. you, when you saw this, with I'd people. love to see uh, a couple of these at like the, music box with a full crowd see that reaction that'd be pretty good they did actually bring um it was quentin tarantino actually um brought you remember when he had rolling thunder uh pictures or whatever rolling thunder releasing for a brief period of time early in his career one of the movies that he resurrected was the beyond with uh, uh grindhouse releasing and they did put it on like a midnight movie circuit and it did play uh theaters all across the country that would have been like 1998 Nice. That was actually two years after Fulci passed away, unfortunately. Yeah, I don't think he knew that you know his movies had much of a life outside of Italy until uh, I believe it was 1996. He came to New York to be a part of a Fangoria convention and met like you know I mean it was sold out shows and all these people kind of you know who had seen his uh, movies you know and loved them. And I think that was, you know, right then that he kind of began to realize that, oh, like people actually have kind of, you know, seen these things. So I think he was pretty down in his luck and nearly penniless by the time that he, you know, for the medical bills and all that stuff. Sure. Hopefully that experience like gave him something at the end. And like, hopefully he knew that people enjoyed his stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. the guy, you know, I mean, we're talking about it like a uh, lovable Uncle Fulci or whatever, <laughs> or Uncle Lucio. But I mean, he was a... Uh, um, a, character. a weird dude yeah i mean he was um known to be a tyrant on the set uh didn't care about actors at all came from the alfred hitchcock school of you know actors or cattle that you just put in front of a camera and he'd yell at people and belittle them and uh, you know that tells me that he's not a very huh? communicator uh he was well, accused yeah of, fuck him <laughs> yeah i mean there's a there's a deeply misogynistic streak that runs through some of his movies actually i was toying with the idea of bringing new york ripper uh tonight which is much more graphic and gory than this but it's also a very ugly and sleazy movie <laughs> and some of I've his other tales films are, about that movie yeah well if you guys if your stomach if you have the fortitude maybe i'll do that sometime in the future but you know you need you need a fair warning going into that one <laughs> Um, okay, so this movie, uh, also called Gates of Hell, right, is part of the unofficial Gates of Hell trilogy. Um, this one was the first one in 1980, and then uh, that was followed up by both uh, House by the Cemetery and The Beyond uh, in 81. 
And all three of those films deal with some kind of event that opens one of the seven gates of hell. I think they actually codify this in uh, in the beyond, the seven gates of hell. And mm-hmm. in which case, reality is going to break down and evil is going to take over the world. And there's usually zombies. And in each th- so, one of those three. So the, so, the, so the trilogy, it's not connected story wise. It's just connected like thematically. Correct. Yeah. They never actually okay. do a reference back to any of the. And Katarina McCall, who's the uh, star lead leading lady here, is the leading lady in all three of those. Um, zombies and maggots in all of them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my. <laughs> well, the zombies in zombie are. Um, like I actually prefer those in many ways to the zombies yeah, of uh, Dawn of the Dead, right? Because they have mm-hmm. this like earthy look to them. They look old, decayed. Dirt. Yeah, instead of the blue, pale faced, you know, creatures. Yeah, they look dead. I like I like the this look better. Yeah. Well, it's this one. Remember the one in Zombie that has the maggot crawling in his eye socket? Yeah, the we are going to eat you zombie. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that's some good stuff. Um. Did you know that Lucio Fulci also made a version of one of his films is uh, Jack London's White Fang? What? Oh, yeah. Wait, what? Say that again? White <laughs> Fang, right? The uh, not Call of the Wild, the other one. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. The reverse Call of the Wild. Yeah. 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 He did a film uh, version. I, I know of what you're talking about. I'm just trying to understand <laughs> what you just said. Wait, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Wait, say it again. I, I'm- That's what I'm saying. He had a varied career. You know, I mean, guy worked for, I don't know, was it like 40 years or something like that in film? Colin, that sounds prime for freak show viewing. I, <laughs> I watched the trailer. I haven't actually seen the movie, but yeah. Colin, um, you're also no longer allowed to say, did you know before saying up whatever you're about to say? <laughs> I saw Sean's face. I was like, he is instantly going to Chuck Norris right now. You need to take a break from it. <laughs> I'm expecting jokes. Can't do, did, did you know? All right. And I can't tell if I'm disappointed or relieved when <laughs> the joke doesn't come out. I don't know. It's, I just, I saw it wash over Sean's face. I'm like, he's waiting for the Chuck Norris joke that's not going to come. Yeah. You got to listen to like our last three or four episodes, ladies and gentlemen. You'll get all the Chuck Norris jokes that you're ever going to need. Uh, red flag. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, this movie, um, yeah, so Italian horror movies, right? Well, first of all, the thing you got to know going into Italian horror movies is that they uh, generally don't record um, audio uh, sync sound, right? I noticed, yeah. Yeah, how interesting <laughs> was the for you on this one? Um, well, I mean, since... We know at this point. Yeah, since, since we, we expected know, yeah. at this point, it's not distra- It's not as distracting anymore. It's part um, of the charm. Yeah, I, I think when I, I think probably when I first started watching Italian horror, it was like, what the fuck? Like this is just ridiculous. But now it's just like eh, I know what's coming, so it's not really. It doesn't really phase me. How happy this makes me to hear this. It's like <laughs> happened through through the Saturday Night Freak Show because now you're developing that acquired taste. You know, right? You're like, oh. yeah, I like. Helen. Huh? Did I, say, I didn't say I liked it. I no, said, yeah, but there, uh, you can tell it. You can t- it's exposure right, yeah. thing. <laughs> this is Helen's goal so It's like, they watched it. They didn't care about uh-huh. the audio. He's conditioning us. Yep. <laughs> um, the, uh, okay, so uh, I don't even know if I was going to say the plot. Mm, the, the story. That's a, a generous, <laughs> generous term. The, the scenes that happen in a certain order. I don't know. I don't know how you break it down for this movie. <laughs> the scenes that were filmed for this movie. Right. And somehow edited together. Right. Yeah. Cause they, I mean, this is a, this is, um, okay. So defenders of these movies, right. Which I mean, I guess I'm going to say that I'm a defender of this genre, but again, you like guess. it's a, it's a acquired taste. You, you absolutely are. Yeah, but I know there's like a higher part of my brain that goes like, okay, this is bad, you know, <laughs> but there's another part of you that's like, you know, kind of, uh, once you develop the, once you get, uh, kind of in sync with the rhythm of it, then you're like, oh, I kind of, you know, I dig this and I don't like that one, but I like this one and that kind of thing. Um, they, so the defenders always claim that Italian horror movies work on a level of nightmare logic. Mm, yes. Right. That's that's apparent in this one for sure. But is that what's going on? Because like when I look at the movies of David Lynch, I say like David Lynch makes dream logic movies. His movies feel like dreams. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know that that's what's going on with uh, Lucio Fulci <laughs> or his screenwriter, Dardano Sacchetti, who also wrote uh, Karate Warrior and Karate Warrior 2. That's right. <laughs> there you go, Tom. Uh, and a bunch of the other uh, Fulci you. movies of the uh, era. Um, yeah, okay, so plot really isn't a big concern to them. They're like trying to make imagery, right? That's mm. just sometimes nauseating, sometimes uh, creepy stuff that sticks in your mind that you'll remember after you saw it, you know? Um, but the plot in this movie, so it kicks off in the town of Dunwich, um, which of course you'll know is the, the setting of uh, the H.P. Lovecraft story, the Dunwich Horror, right? So we're like, okay, we're doing some type of H.P. Lovecraft homage. And it starts off with uh, a priest hanging himself in a graveyard. Um, what'd you think of these scenes? And uh, what uh, are you going to lead us into like what's going on in New York at the same time also? Um, this is a very, uh, uh, we're really getting into it right off the bat. Because we start with a seance around a Manitou table. Um, and it's her having the seance and the, and the uh, priest in the graveyard at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is where Holly mentioned that daytime, or Michaela mentioned that daytime graveyard scenes are creepy or weird. Um, but uh, she's having the seance, and is she, she's seeing what we're seeing, like the priest hanging himself? I believe so, yeah. And this is what she's saying, this is opening the gates of hell, like his actions are the start of it all right there. This is what I got from it. Yeah, when you kill so, you. So, okay, so here's, okay, so question. I like so that you think that we're going to have an answer for this, but. I, <laughs> <laughs> so she's, and we're saying she, this is Mary we're talking about, right? Mm-hmm. Mary's is, is part of the seance. She is watching this happen in real time. Like it's in her, she's seeing like, uh, she's having a spiritual moment where she's like seeing it, but is it happening in real time? It's happening while the seance is happening. Right. I took she's it not seeing, way. she's not seeing something that's already happened in the past. She's seeing something that's happening right now. Good. Because I wasn't sure, but like his, his gravestone said he died in 1980. So I was like, okay, so I'm guessing she's seeing it happen right now. And it's not like a past event. Yeah. I thought, I thought that it was happening. Like she's witnessing the event as it's happening. It's fortuitous of them that they're having a seance at the exact same time that the guy's killing himself, but cosmic horror. Yeah. That's how it works. All these things line up. Uh, this was all foretold in the book of Enoch, we're told, by the, uh, the psychic madam, uh, which at some point she's about to tell, like, the police. <laughs> the police come in. This is a- Yeah, she's like, I can tell you everything. It's... <laughs> <laughs> and then fireballs and started fireball. erupting. Yeah. Fireballs from nowhere. Random fireballs. <laughs> This is never addressed again. There's no explanation given for it. It just uh, fire starts shooting up out of the floor. Everybody goes over there and be like, "Well, where, where, where'd that come from?" We don't know. Okay, well, but moving I just, on. I love, I love the weird shit that happens in this movie and the reactions to it. Like people are literally watching fireballs come through her floor, and they're just like. Does anyone live below you? Like, <laughs> what? Right. Does anyone live below you that would send fireball to your floor? Right. Yeah, nobody's freaking out and calling the uh, fire department yeah. or sounding the alarm. It, or it happens. It happens later on again when they see like a dead woman that they know is dead, and then all of a sudden she's gone, and she's like, "Did she just leave?" Like, what? <laughs> oh my god, that scene! The way they acted in that scene was. The reactions in this is ridiculous. And the bad therapist is just like, you silly woman, calm down and just breathe. He's the worst therapist. Like, maybe there's, there's like an some, explanation. She got up and like left. like some soap opera style acting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is. And they're all American. I'm just putting on the British accent because it sounds better. No, the uh, the lead guy there, he's um, so the guy with the beard, Jerry, the psychiatrist. He's an Italian actor. I think that's, again, what we were saying about the Italian films where they'd record without sound. Is because they knew they were going to be exported, you know, across the world, and so they just dubbed them. But every country had like a uh, recognizable face. You know, Katrina McCall was from England. Um, uh, Christopher George is American. You got the dude from Italy. You got the blonde girl from Sweden. You know, and they're all in the movie. They covered their faces, yeah. Yeah. Um, but we, for, we neglected to mention that at this seance, after this priest that kills himself, uh, Mary drops dead. Right. 
At which point she has she has vision. So she has visions. Yeah. Like of the priest, but then she had. I don't remember. Do they talk about the other visions that she has at this point, or is that later? I believe that. W- well, which visions are you talking about? But did she go? Well, no. She co- did. She call them her the trials. Is that what she was calling them? Oh, uh, maybe I missed this part. What, what happened? <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I was so fucking lost. Anyway, she drops over from fright. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She dies. And this is in New York. This is happening in New York. She's seeing uh, through remote viewing what's happening in Dunwich, which I don't think we ever established where Dunwich is. In Lovecraft, obviously, it was New England, but here it's the South. Uh, We can tell by the vegetation. (laughs) Oh, I would have thought New England. Oh, okay. Well, maybe that's what they were going for. I think so, because they are in New York. I don't think they are traveling that far. Well, they set out to... Oh, well, okay, we'll get there. So anyway, she drops dead, right? And then Jeffrey Wright's cartoonish cop brother shows up. Oh, that guy was great. Are that guy was great. Telling me, what were you smoking? Yeah. Were you on this? <laughs> <laughs> he was the one who was about to get, like, uh, who actually did when the fireball shot up out of everything. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so I, so they, never, they never established who the people at the seance with Mary were, right? That They didn't talk about how they were connected. Spiritualists. No, I don't know. I don't okay. Because so yeah. like, none of them were very, like, heartbroken about her dropping dead. Yeah. No, the one with the glass and, and the beard is like, Mary's dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and, then just, when the like cop a... com- and then the cop comes in and he's like, so you're telling me that she died of fright? And the guy's like, yeah. <laughs> like, just, nobody <laughs> cares. That's, that's what happened. Yeah. Nobody cares about anything in this movie. They all kind of react with, no. is this because things are so horrible they just can't process it? Or it's just really bad acting and directing? I don't know. Um, uh, we're going to leave that up to the, the beholder, <laughs> I guess. Um, so enter Christopher George, right? Uh, Christopher George, you'll remember we did a movie that he was in, uh, called pieces. That was fucking great. You got to go back. If you haven't seen pieces, there's a, that's a Spanish horror movie, but fantastic. He started two in weeks in a row. We're talking pieces. Yeah. He started in that with his wife. Uh, it's Linda almost Day like Colin George. wants to revisit it. Uh, you, uh, it's isn't it coming to the you got to you got to see pieces you got to check that one out. Christopher, I haven't seen yeah. pe- I haven't, haven't seen pieces. It's like either. Colin wants to I do was, a I one that night. Oh man, I wasn't either. What? None of you? <laughs> I've uh, seen none of us, Colin. But I, I wasn't, wasn't on the episode. Oh, okay. Yeah. So Michaela understands the the bastard. Yeah, he's almost watch bastard. Yes. <laughs> bastard. Oh, it's the fucking greatest movie. Um, so. Well, Christopher George, right? So this guy it used to act with John Wayne, like back in the day. He was in uh, El Dorado, I think, right? I think right. he was in yeah. Chisholm. Yes, he was he the was bad a- guy in El Dorado. Yeah, right. Yeah, the bad guy in El Dorado. Um, he was also in Harm's Way with uh, John Wayne and the train robbers. Uh, so, but Christopher George, I want to take a moment here just to explain like who this guy is because now you know. I think I keep on running into his movies. As I'm watching these like 80s horror movies, and sometimes I see him and his wife. Like, there's they were in a movie called Mortuary together. Uh, they were in Day of the Animals together. They were in Pieces together. Um, but Christopher George, he was in Grizzly, the the Grizzly Bear Jaws, which you know, there's another one. Uh, Graduation Day, the slasher movie, he was in, in Enter the Dra- or not Enter the Dragon. What was the? He was in uh, Enter the Ninja uh, yeah. because he knew uh, he was at a black belt in karate. Uh, he was a U.S. Marine during the Korean War, so much so that, like, on May 5th, 2009, the Marine Corps actually flew a flag over the Iwo Jima Memorial in honor of Christopher George's service in the war. Wow. Uh, nice. He also, at one point, was a private investigator. He was a bartender. This is back when guys actually, like, lived a life. You know? right? <laughs> he wasn't <laughs> just an actor. He was like, oh, yeah, I solved murders on the weekend. Yeah. He posed in That's Playboy awesome. or Playgirl in uh, 1976. He was in the movie. Shut up! <laughs> he, that guy lived a life. He was in the movie Midway, the big, like, uh, expensive the movie. And But uh, a lot of people probably know him. as the. Uh, he was in a, a TV show called Rat Patrol, which I believe was a World War II thing. And he is also uh, the uncle of uh, Vanna White. <laughs> oh. Put the cherry on top. There you <laughs> the go. Uncle of Vanna White. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah, Christopher George. He's like uh, one of those guys that brings your gravitas to your movie, even though, you know, I mean, is he slumming at this point in his career? I mean, the poor guy died of a heart attack, uh, I believe, 1983. So two years after this was released, he was 52 years old. Uh, his wife. I thought Linda, you were going to say he died of a heart attack on set of this movie, and no. like that's how he went out. <laughs> be like, Whoa. I think wow. yeah, they, and they puppeteered his dead body for the last half of the movie, like weekend at Bernie's. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That explains the that explains the stiff acting. <laughs> oh, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you're basically seeing him at the age, you know, pretty close to the age when he died. Unfortunately, Mortuary was his last movie. Um, but he's a re- he's, got, he's got charisma though. See, that's I think that's it. Like movie star uh, X factor, right? Mm. He's he's got that something. Yeah, he's good in like everything that he does, even when he's in Italian horror movies or yeah. low budget eighty slasher movies. Um, the uh, he's a reporter who gets on the case. He's assigned, I believe. Um, oh no, uh, Fulci. I was going to say he's assigned by Lucio Fulci in the movie, but Lucio Fulci, like Alfred Hitchcock, appeared in most of his movies. In this one, he's a, a medical examiner. He's on the screen for a little bit. Um, but Christopher George is sent to investigate the um, the seance death or something, right? That leads him to a cemetery sure. where he hears uh, Mary somehow wakes up in the casket Right, presumably after she's been embalmed. Yeah, I was wondering about the uh, the process in this. Did they embalm her at some point? Like, <laughs> is she they, is they she the to. living dead? <laughs> what is she like a zombie? Is she the living dead? Like, what's the rules here? What what's going on with her? I, I thought she I thought she was at first, but then the more the movie went on, I'm like, I don't think she is. I think she's just back. Yeah. yeah I- think so maybe their yeah techniques weren't as they were just like yeah throw her in the casket where she's good well, i think <laughs> maybe they're trying to do this kind of uh horror fantasy thing where you always have to have like the agent of light you know to fight the agent of darkness we know the agent of darkness is the priest uh you know whose death sets this whole thing in motion and she is the agent of light who basically is brought back to life, presumably by uh, heavenly spiritual forces, right? Sure. And her goal, by the end of the first act, she's given a goal, which is to get to the town of Dunwich before All Saints Day and destroy this phantom priest. Otherwise, the gates of hell will open, right? And consume the world. That old chestnut, yep. Yeah. Um, All Saints Day. You know what day that is? It's the day Mark Wahlberg. It's the day after Halloween. Uh, it's the day after the Halloween. Day. Okay. So that means. Oh, is it? Yeah. So yeah, this, Halloween is All Hallows Eve. Mm-hmm. All Saints Day. Okay. Yeah. So it's November first. So this actually movie yeah. takes place on Halloween, and no, there's no Halloween decor. Nothing yeah. that would tell you that it's Halloween. <laughs> That's a waste. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Presumably because Italians don't celebrate Halloween and, uh, you know, or did they at that point in time? I don't know. And we're unaware of the significance of the holiday. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just like, yeah, it's October 31st. It's the day before All Saints Day. Other um, countries like don't celebrate Halloween the same way we do in America. That's for sure. Like, yeah, it's yeah, a holiday kind of, that well, we we've exported. definitely transformed into our own thing. Right. Yeah. Um. So anyway, these two take off on a road trip to find the town of Dunwich uh, together. Uh, the resurrected Which, Mary. Again, with the people not reacting properly, like Mary comes back to life. And, and like the next scene, she's like, let's go get some food. Like she's not really phased by the fact that she's died and come back. Nobody's like really phased by she's, that. She's seen some shit, and she's just like, "Yeah, let's check out the nightlife." Like, it, it makes no sense. Yeah, well, Mary even alive her, in a coffin. <laughs> her friends yeah, don't even that make was a big horrific. deal about it. That was horrific. She's buried alive, wakes up in a coffin. That is true nightmare shit, that's, right there. And she's the just like, nightmare. "Yes," and she's just like, "Let's go to dinner." Like, what? You woke up in a coffin. You need therapy. Well, what's even more nightmarish about that is the way that Christopher George rescues her from the coffin. Because, you know, if you want to yeah. break someone out of a coffin. <laughs> My God. 
hit it with a pickaxe, like in where the, the head is. <laughs> yeah. So we get multiple like shots. I was trying to give her holes to breathe. Yeah. But that was pretty intense and a nice, yeah. uh, nicely done effect sequence where like the, uh, you know, the pickaxe is coming in like right next to her face. It actually looks like a pickaxe is, you know, looks, yeah. you're like, that was Ugh. terrifying. looks very dangerous. Um, so yeah, she's fine after all of that. Yeah, she's perfectly fine. Agent of light, man. Agent of light. She's the chosen, chosen warrior in the battle against the evil unleashed in Dunwich. Is she? She doesn't really do much. Well, Dunwich, we're told, is that's because we've got to introduce a whole bunch of other characters here, Sean. Some of them are victims and some of them are heroes. Um, we like move Bob. Who's Bob? Well, okay, but first we <laughs> Pervert <meet>. Bob. <laughs> pervert Bob. Who's the pervert <laughs> Bob? How do we meet Pervert what? Bob? What did he do to Anne? Yeah. He, uh, the, I think the first time we meet him, he w- goes into an abandoned house and finds a, a fireplace... He reaches into the fireplace. He pulls out a blow-up sex doll. So they're all just like, hmm, how do we establish that he's a pervert? Any ideas? Anyone? Anyone at all? <laughs> well, we've got this sex doll. doll in the back. How about yeah. that? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, Bob is a weird one. Uh, he's played by the Italian actor Giovanni Lombardo Radis, uh, who went by the name John Morgan in a lot of the movies that he was in. But you horror weirdos will probably know him. As the guy who gets his dick chopped off and eaten in the movie Cannibal Ferox, if you're going for the hardcore, <laughs> hardcore gore splatter classics. You know, surprisingly, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> well, you probably saw him, Sean, in the remake of The Omen, where he played the uh, the old priest, right? That, uh, oh! Yeah, he was in that. But he was also in House on the Edge of the Park. He was in Cannibal Apocalypse, uh, Stage Fright, uh, The Church. And he was in Gangs of New York. So there you go. He gets around. Still working. But he's Pervert Bob. Who, like, one of the girls in the town excuses Bob as, like, you know, they just kind of avoid him. Why is everybody picking on him? It's because he's sick. And what was he? Sick and lonely. Bob's portrayed as maybe a guy who's a little bit touched. Who among us? (laughs) He wanders around. But, like, the entire, uh, uh, the... The folks of Dunwich who gather at the local bar where they serve Schlitz. Uh, ah, beer. yes, the Schlitz conversation. <laughs> what was, Colin what has was apparently Schlitz? never had a Schlitz. No, I've never had a Schlitz. And what? you're a Midwesterner and you've never had Schlitz. I don't know that I've ever had a PBR That's... either. What? Yeah, what? I don't believe okay, that. Oh, believe I was that. always I like, uh, uh, well, we had like the, the cheap ass well, beer. You had a PBR light. That's the question. I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> Why I know. Why would I waste my time with the PBR light? <laughs> yeah. We went, we or went, PBR when we went slumming, we went all the way to like Milwaukee's Beast, you know. Oh, Milwaukee's oh, Best well, is, yeah. Hate yourself. I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, maybe the PBR Schlitz, and the Schlitz was Schlitz too. Is good. Top shelf. This is good with a shot of Malort. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> when I was in college, Schlitz was like my go-to beer, and I got made fun of all the time. They used to say, like, what are you, like a 60-year-old man from central Wisconsin, you know? <laughs> That's yeah, my you favorite. smoke cigarettes without filters? Come on. <laughs> Some lucky strikes to go with yeah. that, Schlitz. <laughs> I got the filters and shoved it in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Do they still make it? Is it still around? Schlitz still a brand, yeah, or did it get it. absorbed oh, yeah. by? It's not I, as easy uh, to find as PBR, but they still make it. Go to Chicago. There's, it's all over. Okay, it's so. like the one of the only. I think Schlitz is only around because they serve it in bars in Chicago. I think that's how it survives. Wait, is that a Midwestern beer or something? Or like it's a Milwaukee Schlitz? beer? Yeah. Oh, is it? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's like a sister brand to PBR. Okay. Well, I only bring it up because there's a big neon sign for it hanging in the, uh, you know, the window of the local pub where the locals all gather. Um, the locals talk like it's 1925. <laughs> right? I love these guys. These guys are my favorites. Oh, okay. I was going to say, not that I didn't enjoy them because I did. What was their point? Uh, they provide. Did they serve any purpose to this movie? I think in addition to giving us the backstory on Dunwich, right? The locals all tell us that like Dunwich is built on the, 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 uh, or over the top of the original Salem, right? So you're right. It is a, uh, East coast movie, but, um, yeah. 
So, you know, there were witch hangings and like all the ancestors like burned witches or whatever back in the day. So, of course, the whole town is cursed. These guys, um, I think they're just supposed to. Okay, here's my issue with the one of the issues with this movie is that there are constantly events happening that we don't see that are told to us by these guys. Right. Or some of the locals. Did you hear that Tommy and Amy also disappeared last night? That makes five people that have disappeared. So-and-so went over there and never came back and that kind of stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Which we right. should be seeing. So it's, like their own, so it's like their only purpose is exposition and tying the plot together. Yeah. And eventually becoming zombie fodder when it all goes to hell. But they're presented as basically the redneck, uh, you know, inbred, uh, you know, um, the, the folks who live in in Dunwich, they're right. the, the lifers. Very calm uh, about happening. Small town bar. <laughs> yeah. Mirrors break, walls crack. The like, <laughs> yeah. I'll take another. Probably beer. just a truck. It's probably just a truck. Big old truck went by. That's fine. <laughs> That's why your wall cracked. In your brand new uh, new construction in this, you know, bar. That building clearly, was not new. That no, fucking building was not new. Clearly been there for a hundred years, but he's like, oh, it's a brand new yeah. wall. It's brand new. It was built 40 years ago. Yeah. That's well, they're new for them. They're also the guys who jump the quickest to like, you know, mob justice. They're kind of like, it's that Bob. That Bob is causing all the trouble. I know it's him doing all this and we got to go get Bob. I think actually one of the customers is the guy who eventually does get Bob. Um, Cause there's all sorts of strange things happening in the town of Dunwich. This is while the reporter and Mary are still on the road to try and get there. Um, there's also the, uh, psychiatrist who will come back to in a minute, but, um, there's a, the, in one of the movie set pieces and probably the scene that if you've seen this movie, you're going to remember, uh, there's a couple making out in a, in a car. Uh, this happens the night before, you know, we're talking about this scene with the uh, locals in the bar, but the, uh, they're making out in a car and the evil priest shows up. Evil priest fixes them with a death stare which makes the girl's eyes bleed, right? This was which was really cool. cool. That was cool. How do you think I was they not did that? that. It's just the the tiny tubes going around their eyes to to let the blood in. Uh, done very well. I was very surprised. By yeah, this. that so was they, cool. They're actually mm-hmm. injecting blood into the eyeball, right? So it goes along the bottom eyelid and then bleeds out, and these blood tears. And you're sitting there. The first girl, I was like, okay, I can figure out how they do this because her hair is framing her face. And so there's little right. tubes. But later when it happens to Katarina McCall, like they do a close up and I'm like, where are the tubes? Yeah. Oh, look, her bottom lashes are fake. I'm like, this is pretty, you know, I'm like, wow. It's pretty well done. I know. It's yeah, like, it is. How come we never see this anymore? Now they just go like, oh, we'll CG it in. But I'm like, look at how oh, yeah, convincing oh, well. that fucking shit is. <laughs> Cheap ass yeah. Italian movie from 1980. <laughs> Yeah, yeah nowadays got, they would cut to the eyes already bleeding or something like that. Or yeah, they the wouldn't eyes. be able. I don't think they'd be able to find an actress who'd be like, "Yeah, I'll do that." Yeah, yeah maybe. Blood enough. We're gonna put dye in your. Oh, it's just food coloring. We're gonna put food coloring in your eyes. No, <laughs> no, just this like I do. Like red, lead-based paint that they're running through <laughs> tubes through her eyes. Well, Katarina McCall survived. She's still alive. So yeah, the okay. the, the second one, Mary, who oh. eventually gets it. Not sure about the first girl. I'm sure she's fine. Um, the guy in that scene is also, uh, if you're a fan of Italian horror, that's um, uh, Michele Suave, who we've talked about on this show. I think this puts him on the, the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, along with Lucio Fulci. Fulci's on the wall tonight. Uh, nice. Michele Suave uh, was the guy, if you remember the movie Demons, he was the guy with the uh, silver face, half face, that was handing out the tickets to the Demon movie. Anybody? You guys weren't here for demons. Yeah. And, I wasn't uh, there for demon. He directed. I've not seen it. Oh man, <laughs> it's, oh, it's really good. These are classics of pieces and demons. There you go. You guys got to see this. And uh, is that he, my is that my double feature? I need to watch pieces and demons. I think oh, you man. could. You are not going to want to eat. That's some quality <laughs> stuff though. Yeah. Those are it's like good, those are like if you're going in for Italian horror, those might be. Yeah, I'd recommend like check those ones out uh, for starters. But he was also, he directed Cemetery Man, which we uh, also uh, covered on Fuck the show. Fuck that movie. Boo. Yeah. Yeah. Boo. Fuck that movie. So um, many people love that movie, though. Yeah. I hate that movie. I per- I'm sorry, guys. I purposely missed that night because fuck that movie. <laughs> I remember I gave that a bad review and I've changed my mind. Coming back around. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, 
So this scene um, after the girl bleeds, right? Uh, what happens next? Tell me, describe in, in excruciating detail, like Lucio <laughs> Fulci would want you to. What happens in this showstopper moment? Who's gonna, who's gonna go to bat for this one? <laughs> uh, all of her entrails proceed to slowly slide out of her mouth. <laughs> she literally pukes her guts out, but like, just, like, but she's but she's motionless and it's just tumbling out of her mouth. Like a magician pulling scarves out of his yeah. mouth, just yeah. tumbles just <laughs> bleh, out. But, but, and it doesn't all look the same. Like it starts no. off kind of like yellow, like or like like kind of like um like a jam or a jelly, like it's like a strawberry jam with like seeds in it. It kind of looks like that first. But then it, it yeah, you like see the different parts of her intestines what? and stuff. That's what's so impressive yeah. about it. And then I'm pretty sure a liver or something comes out. It's gross. Yeah. It's Awful. fantastic. Yeah, and she's just motionless, just sitting there while it's all slowly oozing out. Yeah, it's it's yeah. disgusting. It's a it's showstopper. <laughs> if you remember this movie, it's the one where the girl vomit. That was actually uh, veal tripe. Apparently, that they cleaned no. off, covered in goo, and stuffed in her mouth, and she <laughs> pushed. That poor actress <laughs> pushed. Don't oh, get paid enough for that. <laughs> um. Well, then, you know, later on it becomes a fake head, and you know, and then it's just tumbling out. Right, and then yeah. I think you're seeing your livers and whatever the hell they were able to get from the, the butcher shop. It's just fucking disgusting. Um, but the, uh, the, so that's why everybody's like, Bob, Bob's doing all this stuff, you know, right? Um, the other characters that are involved here are there's a therapist named Jerry, bearded therapist, and uh, uh, the, his patient who his, what was that, his girlfriend, I think? Like wanders in on was that his girlfriend? I don't know. Was that the girl who I, yeah, vomited? It was. Her? It was his. It was his girlfriend. It was uh, the connections in this movie are so confusing. But I'm pretty sure it was his girlfriend. But then she was going to go check on Bob for right. some reason, and he was just like put off. He's like, eh, like it's fine. I just don't like you going to see Bob because it's Bob. Yeah, and. I don't know. It was just when she got there to see Bob, I was like, I don't understand how this girl is connected to Bob because she does not look like a person that would hang out with Bob. None of the girls who hang out with Bob look like girls who would hang out with Bob. Another one wants to smoke a joint with him later on when they're caught. This is the daughter. That's Amy. Amy. Yeah. What was he doing with my daughter? We showed up just in time to stop it happening. I thought like, oh, God, like the daughter's like this little girl. But no, it's a someone of comparable age. Uh, And but dad catches him. Dad thinks that, that Bob's responsible for all this. And so dad drills Bob's head through with a. Uh, one of those, what is it? A lathe? Uh, no, like the, you know, screw it's a drill drill. It's, <laughs> it's like a, a drill. really long drill bit. Yeah. And it, it, this scene is so long and it takes so long for the drill <laughs> to even start. Like this guy, this guy really couldn't kick him in the nuts and force him off of him. And the amount of time it takes for this to even start. Yeah. It's seriously like Austin Powers steamroller. It, like, yes. <laughs> it's long. <laughs> That's a great analogy. Yeah. <laughs> With the amazing like score of uh, Fabio Fritzi with its you know beat like underneath the uh, this happening because all these movies like, use some kind of like either prog rock or you know Italian movie scores. You got to check them out. <laughs> I, dug, I dug it. I, 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 good, I yeah. like. I really liked the score actually. I did too. Yeah. Well, all of his stuff. I mean, he did all of Fulci's movies. I mean, all these guys that uh, worked on these films like they have uh, once they moved out of like the Ennio Morricone uh, you know uh, era. And they moved through like the jazz or whatever R and B kind of you know era, and then they went into this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, this is it's a good thumping you know kind of. It's not disco. What it would really you... it really helps move the movie along. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Even in a scene where you're waiting forever for Bob's head to meet this drill, and that is another like pretty good effect sequence because it looks like yeah. I mean it looks like a real drill. And then his head actually presses into it, and then you're like, okay, well, then clearly the drill must be retracting or something right. in order to allow Even this. so, <laughs> that still looks rough, which, you know, bravo to them. And then we get to a point where it does come out the other side, and then it's his head with two drill bits on either side working. Yeah. Like, But the shot's so done. close, it looks like you know, one's going right through his head. Yeah. 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 It's done very well. It's cool. Bravo, maestro. Bravo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, the other character, like I said, uh, the, the therapist and his patient who's dealing with uh, incest and trust issues with men. This is Sandra. Uh, they end up like having to come together because the whole town starts going to shit as all this like uh, weird stuff that we don't see begins to happen. Apparently, uh, little John, John, his parents are ki- John, John. I love you. Got John, John. Uh, his parents are chewed up by zombies. We don't see that. Right. The therapist has to go over and like rescue him. And then uh, I do like that, though. I like that. He calls he calls them on the phone and his his sister was Emily, the one who died in the car. She puked her guts out. Right. She's the one who puked her guts out. And he calls. He's just like, <laughs> I like his another one where they're not reacting how they should be. It's just like he says, Emily, just kill her parents. Emily's been dead for two days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, we know what's going on. But I, so that's great. But I also <laughs> like when they, when they cut back to the kid, like his reaction. Oh, and yeah. And the move up, uh, the, the, like, the blood dripping into the food and the drink and the table and the blood on the ceiling. Like, I like that we didn't see it. I like how we saw the kid and the aftermath of it, which I thought was pretty cool. Because that's mm-hmm. just horror. Horrifying. Yes. Look how horrifying that is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So horrifying. She's been dead for two days. Uh, I appreciate that Sandra is the only... Is it Sandra? Is that her name? Yeah. The blonde? Yeah. I appreciate that she's the only one having, like, legit reactions to what's happening. She's actually having a mental breakdown. Like, thank you for responding like a fucking human being. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're right. She's the only one. The only one in yeah. the cast oh. that actually reacts right. the way you expect you would react if the dead were coming back to life. You were waking up and finding dead women in your uh, on the floor of your uh, kitchen who disappear yeah, later than apparently walking around your house. Yeah. And Jerry's like... like We'll just, we will search every room. And I'd be like, no, you go ahead. I'm going to leave. <laughs> yeah. Dead ladies walking around. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they meet up with the journalist and Mary, and then they're, all of them are like, we have to stop this, you know, because they tell them the story. Jerry buys it. We're, we're here to basically <laughs> oh, stop the end of the world. a great cut. It's like, <laughs> what's been going on here? It's like, things you wouldn't believe. Cut. And that's the entire story. <laughs> <laughs> that Love actually it. made me laugh out loud. I laughed so hard at that. <laughs> so good. Oh, it's brilliant stuff. <laughs> that, uh, well, they, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Try me. And that's the story. <laughs> it was perfect. Well, mm-hmm. isn't that the scene that's interrupted by the maggot storm from that all of a sudden comes out of nowhere? Oh, God. Oh, boy. Maggot storm. I mean, the windows blow up. I think it is. It's like, and that's the entire story. And they're like, whoof. And then like immediately, right. like they have summoned the evil thing. The windows flow open and maggot storm. Now, a lesser filmmaker would use Rice Krispies and maybe glue a couple of maggots to the actor's face for the close up. Sure. Not Lucio Fulci. It's just rice, Michael. It's just rice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucio Fulci throws like two pounds of maggots in the air on air blowers that are blowing right into the, I mean like the, you can tell the one girl, I think Sandra's got her mouth shut. Cause she's clearly like, <laughs> I'm here. I'm getting paid. <laughs> Some I, things I'm not willing to do. <laughs> I think, no. I, I think I would have to shower for like three days. Like I, just yeah. straight. Do you know how many maggots you'd be finding in your hair later? Oh God. Yeah. And in your, got to bit something flies into your ears. Ugh. I thought about that. I'm like immediately after this scene, like all of these people are heading right to the shower. <laughs> you know, like no, I, I'm not only heading to the shower, but we're forming like a, a monkey lineup where I'm just like, I'll check your hair, you check my hair, yeah, you check his hair, yeah. Oh, it's disgusting. I mean, it is like the whole because fl- you see the whole floor after this is covered with writhing maggots. They're all yeah. over everything. I mean, it's just oh, that's when he gets the phone call from the kid. You know. Emily just killed oh, her yeah. um, But I feel like my skin is crawling right now. It's that's just, the thing. I feel like once you experience that, the rest of your life, you're just always going to be thinking about like, <laughs> is there? Did I miss one? Like or yeah. like, you know? It's, right? Is it? Is it laying eggs somewhere in my yeah. ear? Did yeah. I yeah. My scalp? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're never going to escape that feeling. Like that's, that's just cool. your life now. You're saying as a character or the actor who was a no, part of the scene? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, this is actually, there's a, there, so I guess on the scene of the, or on the set of this scene, uh, some crew member played a practical joke on Fulci and put some maggots in his pipe 
and he lit it and apparently had a couple of puffs before he realized that he was fuming mad, right? But later in life, he came down with um, uh, ventricular aneurysm, viral hepatitis, and cirrhosis of the liver, which he thought uh, was tracked back to this moment in, in City of the Living Dead and that crew member. Of course. Yeah. You know, anytime I hear a story about a practical joke on the set of a movie, I immediately just like, no, just no, because I know it's some asshole doing something like that. It's never... It's never like anything like actually funny. It's always right, it's just never, someone else being an asshole to someone else. Yeah, it's never good, clean fun. No, no. never. <laughs> and they it always ends. Jared Leto. Yeah, and it ends. I know. Was just thinking that. I was thinking yeah. the same thing. <sighs> well, uh, we, so we don't know if he died because of the the maggots, but it's definitely. I I'm, I'm I'm, didn't. I'm, no, cirrhosis <laughs> of the liver from taking a few hits of smoked maggots. I'm not buying it. Ventricular oh, aneurysm. Drinking. No, I that's don't know. That's drinking. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, this all culminates basically in the uh, the end of the movie when the, the it crosses All Saints Day. They actually they are unable. They're trying to find the grave of the priest so they can dig him up and kill him, uh, even though he's like going around town with his teleporting zombies. Did we mention this? They teleport. Yeah. Maybe the first time I think ever. That, I think that's because the like the veil between the spirit world and the regular world is like thin, and they're going back and forth. I think you're speaking my I, language. I know that. I think I'll that's what's happening that. because the gates of hell are opening, and reality <laughs> is breaking down, um, and it's affecting the fabric of the movie itself. Yeah, the whole movie's gone all crazy because uh, the gates of hell are opening. They end up uh, going to a. Why were there jungle sounds? There were jungle sounds in there. There was movie. monkeys. There was baboons in there. Yeah. Because yeah. the gates of hell are opening. Are full of gray gorillas? Is that what hell monkeys? Yeah. Oh, it's the gray gorillas. Okay, yeah, that makes gorillas. sense. And so there you go. Brethren. That uh, makes sense. Well, they end up uh, venturing down into this crypt. Um, Sandra, she gets killed. I think somebody squeezes her brain out the back of her head. Oh, we see that happen to Michaela Suave also. Uh, the zombies yes. grab onto your head, squeeze the brain out the back of your skull, and pull it off and leave a big gaping hole, which sometimes is eaten by rats and lingered on and loving close up. This is my favorite thing in this movie, I think, is the like the sc- the brain grab because the people just stand there and just completely let them do it <laughs> and don't <laughs> even try. And like the way the the zombies do it, it's kind of like when you're carving a pumpkin and you carve a hole in the top and you have to pull the top off real hard the first time. And like the guts of the pumpkin are still kind of attached, so you gotta like <laughs> yank it. That's kind of how the zombies are doing it. Yeah, that's exactly how it is. <laughs> yeah, and all the goopy stuff like drops out of it. I was actually kind of surprised when they killed uh, Christopher George. To be honest with you, it was like what? I was too. And he's I didn't a- think he was gonna die. Yeah. yeah. Just all of a sudden, bam! You're out of the movie, Sandra. Bam! You're out of the movie. A zombie brain crushed out of the back of your head. Uh, climax takes place. In a crypt, or uh, um, sorry, uh, like caverns, catacombs, yeah. underneath the town of Dunwich. Okay, uh, maybe there's the a mining town, underneath. Yeah. right? And so there's all sorts of bones, and I mean it's an okay set design. The the it looks almost like uh, the center of this chamber that they end up in. It looks like all the souls, you know, of the the dead, you know, skeletons are all kind of clumped together, coming down from the ceiling. Yeah, that's what I like. I like that they're coming, like they're seeping, they've seeped through the ground, and now they're just coming and hanging out. I like that. Yeah, that, that was, was cool. cool. Yeah, but the, this is this whole scene is played wordlessly, pretty much by our only two protagonists left. Then are Jerry, the psychiatrist, and uh, Mary at this point. Um, and down there, you know, there's a bunch of zombies. This is the first time, you know, it's a zombie movie, but there aren't scenes that you expect from a zombie movie with you know a bunch of zombies in the streets. Or people trying to dodge zombies or any of that, really. Um, these zombies are just slow moving things that come out of the ground and very, you know, every time they come out, it's very slow and, you know. Uh, which is fine, which I like. It's creepy. It's nice, yeah, it's a nice change of pace. Yeah. And there's only a few of them, but I mean, still, the creep factor, especially when they're all closing in on you in a very tight underground confined space uh, where they're confronted by the, uh, the specter of the priest. I mean, he was a priest. He was a good guy in life, right? It was a suicide, whatever. Came back, he was possessed oh, by like an no, elder god or something. No, being a priest doesn't make you a good person. Well, okay. He, it like, definitely doesn't. <laughs> he's a warrior of God who perverted himself somehow by hanging himself and then opened the gates to hell. The um, 
the inscription on a tomb, though, said something about, I don't remember uh, what the whole thing said, but it said something about the, um, what was it, he who, and the impression that I got was like that there was some kind of cosmic evil force, like they were maybe, because the place was called Dunwich, maybe they're trying to conjure the idea of like Lovecraftian uh, cosmic horror, and this guy was the something conduit like for it yeah. on Earth. There's like a paragraph on that tombstone. Yeah. Yeah, it was a long tombstone. And uh, they do end up defeating him uh, by uh, impaling him. Stabbing him in the gut. It was in the gut or in the balls. I couldn't no, tell. No, that's I think in the crotch, dude. Was it? That was definitely a crotch Was it? I think yeah. they were going for, they were, I think you're supposed to read it as they got him in the gut, but it was clearly lower than that. I, I don't yeah. know, like, uh, Yikes. stabbing him with I mean, a, he was, a giant he was cross. Ro- like priestly robe, so it's hard to tell. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. That's, that's, a, that's a different one. That's a new version of destroy the head. <laughs> I know. Kill the head in the yeah. <laughs> I know because they actually stab the Sandra zombie uh, in the gut and she dies. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, this guy, okay, this is this is where I mean, there's lots of logic problems with this movie, but this is where it really stops making sense. Like, is this guy here. a zombie or is he a vampire? Uh, he is some kind. Why of... the fuck does he burst into flames but getting stabbed with a wooden stake? I think he is like as the ringleader. He is somehow like the the ultimate big bad, a spirit, right, or some kind of vessel for some evil force that's controlling. Right. The and they always have to die in a fire of some sort. Is he the only one who can do the but death? That's not stare? a zombie thing. No, I know, but that's he's the control. He controls the zombie. The zombies are the more mindless ones. It's, he this actually isn't well has. established in this movie, though. You're doing oh, yeah, light work for the movie that's not in the movie, Colin. <laughs> well, this is very true. But he never yeah, really... This, this movie is creating its own lore, because it doesn't follow what we typically know of zombies. Now. Again, yeah. imagery, yeah. 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 He's always underlit and very blue and pale looking. Um, he looks like um, uh, Argento. <laughs> all yeah. The ghouls, all the ghouls look like Argento in this movie, which well, is kind of funny. And I don't know if that's intentional. I haven't read anything about that, but they did have a rivalry, obviously, because Argento's movies were generally well more well regarded than Fulci's movies. Uh, Argento was considered like it was an his artiste, Salieri. You know? <laughs> yeah, but I think you know. So they had uh, a running. You know, they were competitive with each other. Uh, although I think it was more like Fulci thought. You know, it's like what's this Argento guy doing? You know, and Argento's like, yeah, okay, there's Fulci. You know. But toward the end of his life, I guess they actually did, um, you know, uh, reconcile and they were supposed to work on a movie called The Wax Mask, which was a remake of House of Wax, the Vincent Price movie. But Fulci died before uh, he was able to. So um, uh, Argento wrote it, I believe, or co-wrote it. And it was eventually made, um, you know, like a co you know, kind of a uh, post-mortem, not post-mortem, what am I trying to say? Po- posthumous. Uh, yes. Lucio Fulci tribute uh, from Argento, who I think also paid for his funeral because I think I really think that Fulci was really down on his luck at, at the time that he died. Um, so a guy bursts into flames. All the zombies then burst into flames. So it's like the horror is over, and our heroes emerge from the crypt in the daytime. And John, John, little boy, is still alive, and he's across the cemetery from them. He sees them coming out of the grave, and it's all very happy. They're happy to see him, and he's happy to see them, and he runs to them, and then their expressions change from laughter into one of horror, and we see the kid running, all smiles, and then freeze frame. We hear the screams of uh, Jerry and Mary, and then the actual screen uh, uh, ruptures. Splinters. Or something <laughs> splinters and goes to black. So who who fucked up the ending? <laughs> right. What did I miss? What? <laughs> yeah, because I was actually surprised. You know, when it when they were crawling out, I'm like, oh, I don't remember this movie having a happy ending. Because usually these movies don't, right? There's always some kind mm. of post apocalyptic thing where you may have won the battle, but you've lost the war while you weren't looking. You know, the whole world's taken over by zombies. Uh, yeah. So this one was like, wow, this this is a win, right? Happy ending. They beat the bad guy. Uh, the gates of hell are closed. And then we have this ending, which really does feel like somebody just tried to put it together in the ed- editing room to give it a downer ending. And it's like, I don't think he had the footage there. And who knows what was there originally intended. Yeah. But. Uh, Kids a zombie now. They were. Uh, I mean, I'd be, uh, you, you can be afraid of children 
just as being them being children, but yeah. Well, I, I assume that the gates of hell, once they're open, once you, you missed, you know, all saints day, cause they actually killed the guy, the priest, right. You know, well after midnight, then there's no going back hell on earth. Right. But mm-hmm. it doesn't play that way, and we're kind of like, huh? And so the movie, unfortunately, instead of ending strongly, kind of ends with a question mark. Question mark. mark. Yeah. Like, huh? And I think the, the fact that like nobody was really talking during those end scenes, you know, uh, neither Mary nor uh, Jerry were just listening to Fabio Frizzi's music. They're not reacting to the fact that these people that they know coming back. You know, Christopher George dies, and they're like, oh, oh, God, you know, I'm going to step past him, but that's really it. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's a, it creates a very odd atmosphere, I guess, you know, it could have ended stronger, I think. Yeah. 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 Let's put some, like, some optical effects in the kid's eyes or something. Like, I don't know. If that's what you're going for. Make the kid look like a zombie or something. Yeah. I mean, what? Yeah. You know, that's, of- that's why I was like, did I, did I miss something earlier? Did she, were, were there more to, to her visions? Did they show more? Was was this one of her visions that I missed that like is coming true? Did, anything like that? I don't uh, think so. I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Although I did miss it on a previous viewing that uh, Christopher George's character tells her at some point that like he talked to a psychic at some point in the past that told him that he was going to meet a girl who was buried alive. And I was like, what? Right. <laughs> like <laughs> you, you'd remember that, you know? <laughs> like maybe that's yeah. why he stuck around at the grave because he's like, you know. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to meet this girl who's buried alive. Who knows? It took him long enough. Rescued her. Yeah, I know. I've never seen so much back and forth in my life. Just like, just go to the grave, dude. Suspense. Drawing it out. <laughs> yeah. Draw, yeah. Same thing with the drill. Yeah. If we make it last five minutes, yeah. people won't be able to take it. Yeah. Well, all right. But, uh, okay, so that hey, basically... That's it. I said that. I think that's it. That wraps up the plot of the city of the living dead. We're getting that term in quotes tonight. Uh, but I tell you what, we're going to go around the table and we're going to tell you what we individually thought of it and whether we'd recommend that you seek it out. But before that, we're going to do uh, answer some more mail. And in order to do that, we're going to need the assistance of our mailman. And his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Thank you, Igor. That's all you got for me. Thanks, Igor. This is the first episode that we have ever done where we got (laughs) nothing about Igor just teleporting in there and giving him Igor all covered with maggots. Previous ones. Igor coming with all of his entrails hanging out of his mouth. Okay. Can't we just give the poor thing a break? <laughs> the poor thing. It's been, a, it's been a hard year for all of us, Colin. Well, speaking right. of that, Simon Carter. Igor right. died from COVID again. Yeah. Let's well, give him a break. Actually, I guess Did before. Did he start COVID? Probably. Well, he you, ate the bat. You know whose blood is the antidote for COVID? Chuck Norris. Okay. No, oh, Jesus. So... Colin? I can't. I can't, Colin. So uh, before I read you what Simon Carter said, uh, you can uh, also write into us. We'd love to hear from you. We're on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. We're on Twitter. At Sat Freak Show. We've been known to answer emails. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And it's possible that we are also on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show. Uh, Simon Carter says... Uh, About the year, right? He says, you know what's awesome? In these times of pandemic and civil unrest, the freak show remains a constant fun and all about loving movies together. I'm so drunk right now that it almost brings a tear to my eye. Thank you, guys. (laughs) Did I write this? (laughs) (laughs) It sounds like something you would say, Sean. (laughs) It does. It does. Aw, thanks. That's That's very sweet. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, We're just in different basements now. That's right. But virtually together. Um, yeah. About uh, City of the Living Dead, uh, Karate Warrior 2, after we said we were watching City of the Living Dead, and we posted some of the imagery, said, okay, I'm in for this one. So we are awaiting okay. Dom's specialized review system uh, <laughs> for sit once he actually watches it. So that might be on next week's episode. Uh, Reader1717 
wrote in to say that I'm embarrassed to say that I've never seen any of Lucio, Ful- Fil- Lucio Fulci's films yet. Um, there's still time. You still can. I know it was his birthday and all that. Yesterday was the day to do it. Uh, Yo Jimbo Ice writes in and says, Fulci's nonsensical Italian splatter punk films were for rent at Family Video for in the $2 for or two for one section. In the early 2000, I'd go through a dozen films a month from them and get a lot of exposure in cult genre and foreign cinema. And it would sometimes take as long to pick my movies as it would to watch them. Those were the days. Anyway, <laughs> this is a gross and bizarre movie defying sense while really lingering on violent, gruesome deaths. I loved it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, Nelson Nascimento says the Gates of Hell trilogy is kind of an acquired taste. As a teen, they always seem slow and incoherent. Shots lingering on for too long, almost voyeuristic. With the years, they've kind of grown on me with the beyond probably being the crowning achievement. It's funny that everyone has like a different favorite of those three. It seems like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, We also asked what was uh, your, the goriest movie that you've ever seen and said evil dead remake was a top contender. Uh, Absolutely. David Forbes wrote in. He said, "Dead alive or brain dead to you folks overseas." Yeah. And uh, Michael Whitaker said, "The miracle of life." <laughs> it is pretty gross. Have you seen this? Uh, one of those educational, oh. I assume. Yeah, it's, it's it's the birthing video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's pretty disgusting. About last week's movie, which was After Earth, Basin Voorhees. <laughs> Says, oh, yeah. uh, I forgot about, I forgot about it. <laughs> Sean had such a reaction just now to remember that movie. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, we watched movie. that movie last week. <laughs> uh, Basin Voorhees says the nostalgia critics take on this is hilarious, and I'm glad you're talking about it. The part where Jaden's voice breaks when he screams, no, dad. <laughs> Which I can't remember, but Grant Parrish says, wow, usually with casting, you might get a faint resemblance between the parent and the child. But in this movie, the two primary actors have an uncanny familiar resemblance. Casting director Douglas Abel outdid himself. Kudos, sir. Kudos. They do look uh, exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. Almost like father and son. Almost. Yeah. Isn't it, I'm not isn't it sure weird? Thank the casting director for... Okay. Uh, Unless they... Comment sarcastic, and we're just not I, reading the sarcasm. Maybe, I, I yeah. think so. Did I not Probably. play the sarcasm? I hope so. Okay. I hope so. That was very no, nice. you did a horrible job. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Next time with more sarcasm. Uh, about <laughs> the previous week's movie we watched was Congo. Uh, Sander Antonades says, I've always felt part of Congo's charm is the great supporting cast with Delroy Lindo, Joey Pants, and Bruce Campbell all playing bit parts. For sure. Peter Gatt said the only thing I remember about Congo is the line, Amy, good gorilla. You Ruben, said it. Huh? There it is. You yeah. intoned it very well. Kyle. I was trying to, yeah. I've seen the you movie. You did. You did well, very well. Wait for the next one. Ruben Padden <laughs> says, stop eating my sesame cake is his favorite line from the movie. <laughs> the best line. Uh, Simon Carter said it was a travesty that Bruce can lead. Yeah. Uh, Ryan Handsome Jansen says it's the Hills Have Eyes gorilla style. Yeah, but, so, uh, Brett, Brett Williams. No, that makes it sound way cooler than it is. That's true. But there true. are eventually gorillas in that movie. They just, uh, even though you've been lied to and the, the advertising, I think they were in a lot of it. Brett Williams said it's a similar type creature, only getting a cameo at the end for the 1983 film Dance of the Dwarves, a.k.a. Jungle Heat. AKA Night of the Dwarves. It even opens with a colleague, a colleague what? of Dever Raffin's character being attacked in the jungle and disappearing. I last saw it on HBO in the 1980s, but I remember Peter Fonda. Peter Fonda is a drunk jerk through that snooze fest. Night of the Dwarves. I'm going to have to look into this. Well, he says yeah. Night of the Dwarves, so I'm not sure dwarfs, dwarfs or dwarves, but you might have to check it out. It's also Jungle Night of the Dwarves. There you go. Um, Michael Whitaker said the book was the same. It was more about the whole adventure, not just the killer gorillas. Uh, Tony Genoway says, if it's been established... Oh, okay. So Tony Genoway says, if it's been established within the episode that they filmed in the Congo and IMDb shows four different jungle locations, shouldn't you, Colin, 
change up your final thoughts on the fly instead of again saying it was filmed safely on a sound stage. Uh, so I had to tell Tony, it's like, well, you had to yeah, bust out some knowledge. There. I had to bust out some knowledge. When we do movies here, Tony, like we're we're researching the hell out of these. <laughs> like we're looking up. Sometimes that's right because we didn't just go to the IMDb. We also went to the uh, the American Humane Society where they have an entry that says that they filmed on a soundstage, uh, two sound stages in Culver city where MGM once rained, they brought in 2,500 live plants plus cockroaches, scorpions, West African chocolate millipedes, tree snakes, wolf spiders, and African bullfrogs. Because apparently Frank Marshall said he had to compromise and, and couldn't give up or he had to give up on filming in Africa because uh, both Rwanda and Zaire were in political turmoil, couldn't find an active volcano. They ended up shooting in Costa Rica for that part. And he said there mm-hmm. are so few jungles left to film. Those that exist are so heavily covered in vegetation that they're too dark. Yeah, there's no way that wasn't on a sound stage. It was too well lit. Uh, the uh, the ruins and all that stuff. Yeah, that's all sound stage. But see, what, what I want to know, right? Because what we were saying on that episode that, like, man, Predator, you know, like when they went used to go out in the jungle and actually do stuff. If you told me right. Predator was filmed indoors, well, maybe it was, right? But I oh. believe that that's an outdoor movie. I do, too. Yeah. yeah. That's in the that's in a jungle. Sl- that's in a forest somewhere. Because there's something you can just tell. It is about the quality of the lighting, I think. It know, is the light, yeah. Yeah, because they're using real trees. They've just brought them in from somewhere else. But they are real right. trees. It's real foliage. It's just it's the quality of the light and the mist, you know, and all that, so they can get it. Um, but, Tony, I appreciate you writing in just uh, so I can yes. have that moment. So thanks for, thanks for listening. <laughs> um, Thank you. So now. We're going to go around the table. We're going to tell you what we thought of tonight's movie, City of the Living Dead. We're going to start with Holly. Holly, we're going you tonight. What did you think? Oh, <laughs> I never know who you're going to say. It's always uh, a surprise. <laughs> well, I figure I went first last time, so I give it to you this time. Uh, what did you think about tonight's movie? Uh, City of the Living Dead. <laughs> City of the Living Dead. Um, yeah, I, I had fun with this movie. There were some parts that were a little slow. Um, but like I, like we said earlier, the score actually really helps push it along. Um, but yeah, there are there are some slow parts. The, um, it's one of those movies that feels like nothing's happening for a while, and then it's just like in your face, stuff that you did not expect. You know, in your face, out of their face. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So it's like those moments kind of make up for like those those stretches of of nothingness that do sometimes happen in these movies. Um, we, you know, we said before that the word plot is very generous when talking about this movie. It, there's not much of a storyline, which is kind of typical in a lot of movies like this. Um, I don't think, uh, Italian horror filmmakers lean a whole lot on the storyline. Um, I don't know that a lot of them are very good at storytelling, if I'm gonna be honest, but I know that's another topic. Um, and uh, that then itself like did kind of drag the movie down for me. I I need some sort of story typically. Um, the characters I think were as confusing as fuck. It was hard to remember who was connected to who and why they were there. Um, so it was a little distracting. But the entertainment factor is definitely there in this. It gives above and beyond gore. It did some things that I've never seen before. It did some things that shocked me it made me laugh made me like have physical reactions to how disgusting it was um so i was really impressed and thoroughly entertained by a lot of things in this movie so i think that makes up for the slow parts the lack of story the zero character development at all um so yeah, I'm gonna recommend it because the entertainment factor is there. It's it's a fun movie and it does some really cool things that I think maybe surprise would surprise a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna recommend it. I think it was I think it was a good time. Michaela, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you said, Holly. I think that like I'm not very well versed in Italian horror. Um, it's not usually my thing, and that's why I'm not very well versed in it. Um, but I do like Fulci movies. I definitely, Holly, you should definitely watch Zombie. I think you would like it. Yeah, I um, want to. Yeah. Zombie's my favorite of his for sure, which I mean is not, It's that's a pretty popular opinion. A lot of people know that one. Um, but I do like The Beyond too. 
Um, and yeah, this is my first time watching this one, and it, I agree, it does have some slow parts, but the score is really good and it does help it. And I think this the craziness and like the commitment to the gore makes up for the slow parts. Um, and just like the willingness to linger on the gore definitely makes up for mm-hmm. the for the slow parts. Yeah, I agree. The plot's not a strong suit of this movie, but at the same time, like I don't feel like it really tried to do too much either. I don't think it tried to overcomplicate things. I think it just didn't follow through on what it established sometimes. Mm-hmm. But there was a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool effects, a lot of cool things to look at, a lot of things you won't see in other movies. And so I think for those reasons, you should definitely check it out. Like, you're, when are you going to see someone else, like, puke up all their guts, like, over what? <laughs> yeah, that had to have been, like, five minutes, right? It was <laughs> like, long yeah. time. so long. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think you got to watch it for for those reasons. And just the slow, like, pumpkin ripping grab of pulling brains out is really entertaining. <laughs> you can see that, like, three or four times, too. So, uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend it just because it's, it's so unique in, like, its choices like that. So I think it's worth watching for that. Sean? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think we're all having the same feelings about this movie. Um, uh, I, I, they're not really, uh, uh, leaning on story to get them through this movie, which is, I think, okay, that's perfectly fine with me. Um, they do a lot of, like a lot of cool stuff in this movie. I really like the way this movie shot. Um, the editing is a, is another story, but again, that just makes it to me more entertaining. Uh, but I think it's shot really well. I like, um, I like the lighting. I like how, uh, when, uh, is it Emily who keeps showing up with her? ghoulish face and everything. Um, I like when they, and near the end when she keeps showing up and they just got that light right under her face and she looks particularly spooky. Um, again, uh, they, five they, their scene. face, the zombie faces, they're almost like they're borderline charred. Yeah. Like the way they look, but like a slick looking, like it looks like, yeah, a greasy charred. It's, it's a good look. I yeah. like it. And she looks very creepy. She had the eye, um, didn't she? That was like going one way and the, at one point, yeah. yeah I was like, what's the- Oh, yeah, yeah. When she's messing with the kid, she's like, yeah. yeah, that was, that's fucking creepy. <laughs> um, it's, it's, I think it's like, it's a creepy looking movie, too. Um, uh, they did a lot of fun stuff in this movie. The effects are like really good. Um, again, they're going for imagery, and I really like what they did with it. Um, I, uh, the uh, score, like we mentioned, score is really good. I had fun with that. Um, yeah, I really had a good time watching it. I'm going to give it uh, three z- uh, zombie brain pulls out of four zombie brain pulls. Um, <laughs> yeah, that well. back long time. <laughs> um, so, yeah, definitely recommend uh, City of the Living Dead. Colin. Well, bravo, Sean. That was a good one. Bravo. Uh, yeah, I'm actually I am surprised <laughs> that yeah. all three of you because I was like, you know, hey, it'll give us a chance to talk about Lucio Fulci a little bit. Um, but now I know. You know, th- these are my people because <laughs> this is uh, right. These are these are like the weed out movies, right? When you when you talk to other horror fans, you know how far down their commitment goes when they go into the <laughs> hardcore splatter classics that are usually reserved for uh, you know making cameo appearances in music videos from like thrash metal bands. They all love this stuff. You know, heads getting <laughs> exploded from you know that's what you see in the all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, I mean, obviously it's an acquired taste. They're hardcore horror films. Uh, these are just because of the gore alone are like, you know, who's doing this and you don't see explicit, uh, lovingly d- hung on or dwelt on dwelt upon gore scenes like this anymore. And, you know, like I said, it's not. My interest in it doesn't come from a you know perspective of um, you know the cruelty really to the, the the people involved. It's when you or the characters. It's more when you watch these movies as a especially as a as a group. You know they take on a life of their own that's different than when you just sit and kind of watch it by yourself. You know it is a uh, I guess that goes back to that whole thing. It's like movies are a communal experience, and yeah, these are audience movies. You know that you sit there and everybody yells or, you know, I mean, I could feel it just in the way that you guys are reacting. And I appreciated that some of you were uh, texting, you know, like <laughs> the photos and uh, emojis of like, as the scenes were happening. So uh, that was kind of what I was hoping to bring, you know, with, by bringing this movie. Um, but personally, I don't think that it's uh, one of Fulci's strongest. I mean, 
I saw that I've seen this several times in my life and I'm, I'm coming more around to it every time that I watch it. Um, and that's the other, the other one, uh, house by the cemetery, which is the third part of this. Like right as of right now, I actively dislike that movie. I know that's probably going to get me. That's the Peter by. Cushing one, right? No, 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 no. What's that one? That's <sighs> there's a Peter, um, uh, house of long Never mind. No, it's the one with Dr. Freudenstein or Freudstein. They move oh, into his old house and yeah. Um, you know, and there's, uh, you know, I, I like, you know, Fulci's Jalo movies, his sword and sorcery, the conquest. I mean, you got to see that at some point because it's just fucking weird. Uh, it's like, Oh, a that's cross what I was between- going to ask. Like, does he bring, you said that Fulci did a, uh, a lot of other genre movies or a bunch of different genre movies. Like, did he bring that? Does he bring that sort of intensity to his Westerns and comedies? Like, how, how, what are those like? Yeah. I've never I mean, seen those. Well, there's, you know, I mean, he lingers on the violence, you know, but I don't think not to the extent that he eventually did in, um, <coughs> pardon me, in, uh, you know, what the, everything post zombie is, uh, oh, he did like, there's actually like a pretty good thriller that he did, um, called the psychic, which, um, that's got a pretty that's got a pretty good twist, but it's like a you know it's a it's just a thriller movie that's really good. He did a movie called uh, I don't know if it's a, considered really a giallo. I've got it. It's called either Perversion Story or One on Top of the Other, which is a San Francisco set uh, like psychodrama, which is kind of a little bit I don't know maybe because it's set in San Francisco, it always reminds me a little bit of Basic Instinct and you know, it's got a femme fatale and all that. I mean, like he made all these films that you know they do have. Uh, um, I don't know, do they have that intensity? They linger on some aspect, whether or not it's the gore or the sexuality or the sleaze in some of them, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, he brings that to uh, all of his work. Um, and again, I haven't seen his entire filmography at this point. I've seen a good many of all the the the, the you know the big ones. Um, there's a movie that he made called "The Cat in the Brain," which he is the star, playing a director of uh-huh. horror films who begins to have like these um, nightmares goes to psychiatrist and the psychiatrist I think is actually like manipulating him to murder the psychiatrist's uh, enemies, you know? So, I mean, it's just really weird. Like that's in the early eighties, like warping the whole idea of, you know, uh, reality in that way before, um, you know, these more before like new nightmare and, you know, scream and that kind of stuff. It wasn't a comedy, but you know, where you would be the star of a movie about, you know, that you directed. Um, so yeah, he's an interesting cat. Uh, there's obviously more to see here in his filmography. Maybe we'll get to some of them later on this show. Uh, but I would recommend city of the living dead for a gory good time and better if seen with friends. So there you go. Bam. City of the living dead freak show approved. Yep. All right. Yes, it is. Very nice. Next week, we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by... Sean, what are we watching next week? Next week? Oh, boy. Yeah, I know. We're going to watch uh, 2001's 13 Ghosts. Oh, boy. (laughs) Recently released on video by Shop Factory, Screen Factory. Is it out yet? (laughs) Sorry, Michaela. (laughs) Well, we already have one dissenting opinion. Uh-oh. I hate this movie. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> well, oh, will Brian. Michaela make it to next week's episode? You're going to have to stay yeah. tuned and find that's out. The, that's when the I, great thing about um, doing these from home is that there's far less of an opportunity for someone to be like, oh, I'm sick. I can't do it. I can't be there. Oh, no. <laughs> but conversely, you don't know if they're actually. I'm going to remember this, Sean. I'm oh. going to remember this. <laughs> oh boy, we've crossed the line on the Saturday night. I was going to say, yeah, but, uh, conversely, you can't tell if oh, she's no. actually there watching it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm giving maybe people I'll just ideas. Go off of my past hatred of this movie. Yeah. All right. Well, you'll have to Good. tune in for the exciting conclusion of Thirteen Ghosts on the Saturday Night Freak Show next week. And until then, <laughs> ladies and germs, the basement is going dark. <laughs>